How is everybody? Good. Got a little uh, caffeine on the break, I hope. Some good conversation. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to tell you just a tiny bit about myself to get started. Um, we'll help contextualize the talk. So I'm a game designer. And what that means is that I care deeply about the future as it relates to the role of games in that future. And I actually think games matter a great deal as we begin to think about the future of learning, the future of the workplace, the future of community. Sometimes the things I design work better than the, the controller. <laughs> Sometimes the things I design look like this. So this was a game called The Big Urban Game, designed back in 2003. Uh, and it was a commission by the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul to help the citizens of the city reimagine the urban plan for that city. And so it was a race between three giant inflatable game pieces over the course of five days. And the play of the game was players debating each day the route that those pieces would take. Um, and the, the play of the game had a lot to do with the juxtaposition of these pieces against the kind of architecture and thinking about what happens when a 25-foot tall blue game piece gets stuck in traffic. What does that mean? Sometimes the things I design look like this. This is a project called Karaoke Ice, which was a commission for the city of San Jose. It's a karaoke ice cream truck driven by a squirrel named Remedios, who uh, lives in the virtual world, but was so enamored with the notion of karaoke as a kind of democratic creative process that he came into the world and was interested in collecting stories from people through song over the course of several weeks. This was a project that then traveled to LA over the course of two months was in almost every neighborhood in LA, and we have an incredible archive of people singing pop songs to tinkle pop music. More recently, the kinds of things I design look like this. Um, this is a school I'm going to talk about today called Quest to Learn. So games and game designers, what they think about is the design of space as a possibility. And so I want to talk a little about, about the notion of possibility as it relates to the future of our kids and as the future of learning. So what can you imagine might be possible if we began to conceive of school not as a single learning space where all learning happened, but as one learning experience in a network of learning spaces that spanned in school, out of school, local and global, digital and non-digital, teacher-led and peer-driven, individual and collaborative? What might the possibilities for teachers be if their creativity around how to engage kids was deeply valued, and they were given the resources, like collaborating with game designers, to begin to reimagine what engagement around learning could look like? What might be the possibility for communities if a school was seen as a catalyst, activating a network of mentors, peers, partners, and leaders? In supporting kids in learning how to be designers and inventors, innovators, and problem solvers. What might be possible for your kids if they were challenged to teach other people how to do stuff that they really know how to do, and that content was valued as an actionable resource, something you could do something with, rather than something just to be memorized? These are all kinds of possibilities that we've been thinking about. What, for example, could be possible for the world if we begin to support kids in being curious in asking questions and building theories about those ideas, in learning how to fail frequently and early in order to learn how things really work, and to engage them with the world at large in ways that feel relevant, exciting, and empowering to them. And most importantly, from my perspective as someone who is very new to this kind of school space, what would it mean to think about the possibility of school not as a problem to be fixed or something to be complained about, but as an actual thought partner in the learning lives of our kids, our parents, and our communities. So this was a question we started with two years ago. So the New York Department of Ed agreed to take on the challenge of a school developed by a small nonprofit that I run called the Institute of Play. And it's a school that became called Quest to Learn. This is a school that opened nine weeks ago in New York City. It's a public middle school started with 79 extremely excited sixth graders, um, and it's going to roll out a grade every year afterwards. Now, the big idea of this school is that we began to say, what would happen if we could design a school that, as a system, was designed around the intrinsic qualities of games and play? 
Okay, this doesn't mean a school about video games. It doesn't mean that video games fill the classrooms, although there are certainly inst instances of that. But instead, it's a, an approach to learning that draws on all of the qualities of how we know games really support players in learning, dropping them into complex problem spaces that are scaffolded to provide just-in-time learning, providing real-time data so players and kids know where they're at, what they know, what they don't know, and where they need to go. Kinds of experiences that really value peer input and put kids in the spot of being teachers of others. So this is the school. Now, in designing the project, we came up with some ideas around four conditions that we felt we had to create to develop compelling curriculum for the kids. And all of this comes from our understanding of how kids are engaging in interest-driven communities outside of school. The very first thing we found we needed to create in them, this is something games do really well, is a need to know. If kids don't have a reason to know something, they're actually not so interested in figuring it out. The second thing we needed to be able to offer was to create in them a need to share that information. So it doesn't matter to us if every kid in the school knows something if they don't share it with somebody else. And from a design perspective, we found that we actually had to design a structure to allow those kids to share what they knew. Okay, so in the school, it takes many different forms in terms of collaborative work, as well as a specially designed custom social network that allows kids to communicate not only with kids in the school, but also with other people that we're collaborating with. And then the last piece is something that we don't think a lot about, is that the knowledge, the knowledge that kids have becomes extra valuable to them if they're able to export it outside of contexts that may be meaningful to adults, but are not so meaningful to them. So the ability for them to export cool stuff that they're doing in school and in the after-school space to spaces that they find a value, whether it's on YouTube, it's on a MySpace page, and an other kind of social network, their own blog, is incredibly important. So for example, this semester in the school, the kids are working on a code-breaking mission. And a need to know has arisen when last week they demanded to be taught how to convert fractions to decimals in order to create a particularly gnarly piece of code that they'd found hidden in one of the library books. They're working with a TV producer this semester to develop a location guide for a new reality TV series. And they figured out that they actually need to know how to navigate an atlas to understand components of a map and understand the difference between character and setting in books. And so yesterday, the many kids um, came up to one of our teachers and asked for some extra books in the library so that they could create a study group in order to create character profiles for contestants that might be on the show. We also have a class where kids have asked to learn how to create more professional-looking video tutorials for a hapless group of fictional inventors called the Troggles, which are a little community that lives in a game called Little Big Planet, who actually know nothing about math and keep inventing terrible things. And so the kids have taken it upon themselves to teach the Troggles the purpose of standardized measurement. And they realized that their video skills are not so great, they felt like they could teach better if they could communicate better, and so they've asked for an extra class in learning how to do video work. So these are the kinds of ways that curriculum at Quest is being developed. We also found that when you begin to think about a networked model of learning, where school is just one node within a kid's kind of learning network, is that you have to develop feedback loops that connect those learning spaces for kids. Okay, so when we, used to, we think about a traditional model, we often think that, okay, a kid's gonna go to a math class, and in a single space, once a day, they're gonna learn math. The truth is that kids needs to see math in multiple spaces over the course of a single day, in contexts that are similar, but slightly different, and in contexts that allow them to practice that again and again and again. So in a network model of the school, for example, we have an after-school program where kids are learning how to make videos. We have a math science class where they're doing the video tutorials to teach the troggles about standardized measurement. And then we also have an online social network that allows the kids opportunities to post and rate and share videos. So they're getting practice there, assessing each other's work around assessment-based rubrics. Now, what these feedback loops do is they reinforce for the kids the idea that they're seeing the idea in different contexts, but they're able to take action on it, again, in ways that are situated and relevant to the problem at hand. The last thing that we've discovered is something that we call the rise. Please rise. Slide. Something we call the rise. In game design, one thing that often happens is something called emergent 
emergent behavior. Players often do things we never anticipate that, they, anticipate that they're going to do. And this is often possible because of the kind of rigid structure of rules provide for the kind of flexibility and improvisation of play. And this balance between a kind of rigidity of a hard skeleton and the softness of play is actually the place where creativity and learning resides, is what we would argue. So as we began to think about the design of the school, we had to attend not only to the rules, to the standards, to the curriculum, to the content, and to the skills, but to what would be those soft tissue structures that would allow for the kind of rise of emergent behavior among the kids. So day three of the school, a YouTube club emerged. Kid had an idea, he recruited a faculty sponsor, recruited 37 kids in the first week to be part of this club. Within three days, they'd all divided into roles. There were producers, there were writers, there were actors, there were camera people. And so now the club is a new node in the learning network of the school. And it's something that literally rose out of the kind of infrastructure that had been put in place because of the network model to allow that to happen. So I actually think the challenge for us and the challenge that I would put forward to you today is I don't think that we're doing enough for our young people to let them rise. In order to do this, it requires us to design systems that enable rise, not design systems that shut them down. And that's what I feel like the way we've been thinking about school for a long time shuts them down. So how do we begin to think about the design of the rise? For me, it goes back to the notion of games as spaces of possibility. Those spaces of possibility provide for players a belief that anything is possible. I believe for schools that these two are the kinds of spaces that they can design if we begin to attend to that notion of possibility. So this is a challenge that I'm going to put forward to you all today. Um, I invite anyone to come to New York, come visit the school, uh, maybe in the spring, uh, when things die down a little bit. Um, but it's remarkable and incredibly exciting work, and I thank you for letting me share it with you today. Thank you. Thank you.